All right, everyone, thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. Um, you know, I'll acknowledge all our 30 online attendees, you know, that are, that are just watching us from wherever they are, we've got a few uh, all, over the, all over the world. But um, so my name is Leo. It's a real pleasure to be uh, back to Melbourne, traveling from Sydney this morning, uh, and uh, to be back uh, at uh, Blue Rock for this event. Uh, I'll be uh, with Axel in seeing this event, who co founder for Startup and Angels, who uh, started the journey uh, on my end in 2016 now. Um, so, you know, I've seen a uh, few familiar faces, you know, who, are, uh, who know the event and, you know, fully uh, love and rave about Startup and Angels. Um, but yeah, welcome and uh, so good to see you again uh, in, uh, in person. Uh, so, some of you in the room have seen uh, on your chairs some uh, QR code. Uh, this one is not for checking for COVID <laughs> purposes. This one is to be able to access actually all the all the slides we're going to be projecting, um, and you know get a chance to actually um, you know vote uh, for some of the surveys uh, and and rate some of the startups presenting tonight. It's also a great way for you to access the the slides. Rather than taking pictures, you know, from the from the screen. Uh, so if you like some some ideas, some concepts, you'll be able to uh, to access the, the deck, um, the extensive deck that we prepared and uh, we'll be presenting today. Uh, so for those of you online, you should just be able to uh, to scan this code as well from your uh, from your phone. Okay. So now let's put this into uh, practice. Uh, now you scan the scan the code. You should be able to see those questions uh, on your uh, on your phone, and you know tell us a bit more about you know who is in the who is in the room, who is online, following the uh, the event. Right. Where, are the, where are the big guys in the room? Not many. There's a lot more. I know a few in the room. They're not the big guys. They're just the big guys. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> I mean, potentially you will, you will hear all about equity like, crowdfunding tonight. So we are going to be an investor at the end of the day, right? Maybe no. I mean, uh, everyone has a in crowdfunding. Sure. 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 <laughs> all right, and all, all events always attract you know a strong mix of you know entrepreneurs. Um, to be entrepreneurs, say your entrepreneurs, uh, you know, in, investors, and um, you know people you know in corporates who you know wants to be inspired uh, you know for either corporate innovation purpose or you know potentially getting into. Uh, you know, uh, as an advisor into, into startup world, uh, you know, potentially have a great idea in the making uh, and, you know, coming here to uh, get, get inspired, learn um, from all of you guys. Uh, so then for we'll, we'll key questions and we'll one day publish, <laughs> when, we, when we actually reach probably the 50 physical uh, <laughs> events, um, but we've, we've done probably over 60 events now. Uh, we've published those stats. Uh, we've organized events all around the, the world, around Australia. Uh, so we've got some uh, pretty big data on what uh, all attendees are drinking uh, that, that we publish. And, uh, you know, a big, uh, so good. a big shout out for, you know, all our partners and, you know, particular Blue Rock for, you know, accommodating all the variety of drinks uh, tonight. Okay, so beer, beer is always, uh, you know, a safe bet in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, so in terms of um, the agenda for, for tonight, uh, pretty busy agenda, but you know, plenty of time at the end, uh, you know, for you to uh, network, get to uh, know each other. Um, so we'll, we'll quick, briefly uh, first have, have Bevan from, from Burrock uh, to, uh, to welcome us. Uh, then we'll uh, talk a little bit about startup and angels, the, the journey to date, um, as I mentioned, uh, getting close to the five year anniversary now. 
Then we'll be talking about a uh, number of alternative financing solutions, thanks to virtual and uh, Transwire. Uh, then we'll have all three startups uh, presenting, pitching, they're all raising money at the moment. So great opportunity for, you know, for, for them to, uh, uh, to share what they are uh, working on at the moment and what's the opportunity for, um, you, know, for you to, uh, um, to get into. Uh, and then we close with the OVH uh, startup program presentation uh, by your partner, uh, OVH Cloud, uh, Yanni. Okay, and then we'll get into the drinks. <laughs> Way ahead of you, mate. <laughs> Bevan, come to uh, come and uh, welcome everyone to uh, to Blue Rock. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Blue Rock. Um, I'm Bevan. This is Jeremy. Um, so we are from Blue Rock. Um, thanks for everyone coming along. Um, appreciate that. Um, yeah, everyone's made the effort to get along to a physical event. It's uh, ironic that we were probably actually downstairs 12 months ago and I was talking about, uh, actually about the opportunity to get together in this pre-COVID world. And then here we are 12 months later and <laughs> um, you know, finally get to have another one of these events. But um, really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'll hand over to Jeremy yeah. to talk a little bit about what we do at Blue uh, Awesome. Well, it's great to have everyone here. And as Bevan said, it's exciting to be back in person. A little bit about Blue Rock, we're an entrepreneurial advisory company. So what we do is we partner with a lot of businesses and particularly SMEs and startups. And we help them in a number of ways. So for myself, I'm in the legal team and I help with the capital raising, the structuring and the M&A activity. Bevan from our accounting team, um, he runs advisory services strategy, um, really helps again, with that fundraising, but all, all the needs from an accounting point of view for a startup business or early stage business. And we have a number of other service offerings like digital, um, private wealth. We have an R&D and grants team who are fantastic and very relevant um, to all startup and early stage businesses, um, as well as insurance and a number of other uh, business lines. So if there's any way that we can help or if anyone sees us at the end of this session and wants to talk about what they're doing or um, you know, their business proposition, we'd love to have a chat see if we can do anything or help you along the way. Yeah. That's great. Right. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so there is a toilet at, so a bit of housekeeping, there is a toilet at the back. Um, so, uh, and uh, it's only single for male, female, but um, there's also there's toilets downstairs. So, um, try the one at the back or if that's busy, go to the one downstairs. Uh, and then if the, um, Everyone has checked in for the yeah. COVID downstairs. Yeah, mm -hmm. so just make sure you checked in and if fire alarms go off, get me behind me and I'll run. All right. I'll, I'll leave a chance to uh, Axel to... Uh, Yes, yeah, so Hello, basically, TI um, Startup yeah, Manager, so uh, we've been doing it for about uh, five years now, a bit more than 50 edition, and basically to make it short, but we really like to uh, meet with entrepreneurs, startups, investors, etc. around the world. We've been doing it in Asia mostly and a bit in Africa, and it's always nice to see that uh, spirit and the dynamic uh, uh, in that uh, space. So uh, really happy to organize a physical event. I mean, at the end, that's why uh, we are here for on social interactions. So uh, it's great to, uh, to start again on, uh, on all that and to share a bit about our journeys, uh, either as uh, entrepreneurs, founders, investors, angels, etc. Uh, some lessons, uh, things we've learned uh, along the way. So uh, thanks again for uh, coming uh, tonight. So maybe one, one word, uh, you know, a number of you are already part of uh, the startup and angels community, but so one of the things we, we launched, uh, you know, over this uh, fully remote period, is an online community where you can, uh, you know, actually access uh, a number of, um, you know, pitch deck templates, um, you know, among other um, yeah, resources. We have um, also a great community you can tap into, you know, from mentors, advisors, uh, investors, and you know, other entrepreneurs that you can filter so you can find people in similar industry 
potentially in other countries or cities. It's all free uh, and gives you access uh, you know, to online events for free or discounts uh, for physical events. Um, so that's something we launched yeah, probably back in uh, May or June last year and we've got over 550 members uh, and um, over 100 startups uh, registered on the, on the directory. Um, you know, as, as some of you have may have noticed, we, you know, we also send a weekly newsletter um, sharing PR from the startup from the community. So if you are you know, fundraising, looking for a co-founder or recruiting, uh, you know, you can actually, you know, uh, amplify the message through the community. And for some of you kind of um, following already your, your podcast, we, we, we launched a podcast over this period as well. We've got over 20 uh, podcast episodes. Uh, you know, with value stories, um, you know, from, from startups, from investors, um, panel discussion. Uh, so, you know, all those resources are, are here for you to, to help you get to the next stage in your, in your startup. Uh, and maybe one, one word about, you know, all company uh, behind Startup and Angels, what, what we do. Uh, so Startup and Angels is kind of just one part of our, uh, of our business. Uh, we, um, the two types of line of services we, we have is helping, uh, you know, with market entry services. So we help a number of international startups landing in Australia. Um, a number of Australian startups go to, uh, you know, grow in APAC or Europe, uh, mainly. Uh, and we've got a pretty solid uh, talent acquisition offers, uh, starting with, you know, um, internship solutions, uh, you know, for startups, SMEs, up to, um, you know, Permanent recruitment, uh, I would say, you know, ideal for uh, mid-management position, you know, for growing, growing companies. And you know, we mentioned that this is startup and angels uh, or, or community. Um, so before maybe we get to, um, you know, to, to Robin uh, from from Bierschel, I say huge, huge thank you to uh, you know all the partners who help us through the, the journey. Uh, you know, starting with uh, Blue Rock uh, and Bierschel actually where instrumental you know, uh, expansion to, uh, to Melbourne and you know, launching the community here, uh, probably back in 2017. Um, we, uh, OVH Cloud, uh, which is gonna be presenting uh, tonight as well, um, which you know, has backed up through this difficult time where you know, a number of companies didn't know if you know, physical events would resume. Um, and, you know, and, and companies like you know, Fund Square uh, coming on board, uh, recently, you know, thanks to uh, thanks to this event, uh, pledge one percent, so which is backed by the Atlassian Foundation. Also, uh, you know, we we helping them uh, with you know social uh, entrepreneurship initiatives. Um, so yeah, very very proud of what we've achieved, and you know, ultimately, you know, I really hope we'll uh, you know have an impact uh, for each of you in this room, uh, in each of you online. Uh, you know, today and hopefully, uh, you know, in the in the near future. And at the end, uh, just to make the transition with uh, virtual and uh, front square. So, uh, yeah, networking like that, we had a lot of uh, startups that uh, networked during those events and they managed to raise uh, funding, uh, early stage funding, like a few uh, tens or few hundreds by connecting with uh, people like that. And we call this startup and angel because at the end of the day, that's uh, the principle of uh, virtual, but anyone can be a business angel as long as you're uh, interested in a story, in a journey, and you can invest uh, uh, some, uh, some money in a, in a business. And uh, yeah, several have managed to do it uh, during those events and during other networking events. So uh, that's, I guess, the, the purpose of uh, networking together. So uh, uh, without further ado, uh, please uh, welcome uh, Robin. Robin. Thanks. <laughs> Oh, perfect, perfect, easy, <laughs> right? Okay, perfect. So I guess we'll start with asking any everybody to answer if they already invested in an equity crowdfunding campaign. Oh yeah, perfect. <laughs> 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 Come on, are we getting it all? Yes. <laughs> Here we go. One out. One out. Two. Anybody else still answering? Or? All right. I think we'll 
probably move on. So I'm actually quite surprised by that result. So um, look, as you can see at the bottom left hand corner, my name is Robin Holt, and I head up the campaign management team at Virtual. And equity crowdfunding first began in 2011 in the UK, where it was first legislated. First company to actually do equity crowdfunding did it without legislation when it wasn't legal, and that was Brewdog, who <laughs> some of you might know have come over to Australia recently. Um, but <clears throat> My journey with virtual um, actually started because I used to work at Crowdview, which was one of the very first equity crowdfunding platforms. It's probably one of the largest um, in, in Europe, most certainly. And I was, you know, joining it as a hustling and bustling startup. And then it really grew exponentially. And I really missed the startup. And so when I could see that the legislation passed in 2018 and the opportunity came about to be able to come and join a platform over here. I started talking to Matt and Alan, who are the co-founders of Virtual, and we were very much aligned on what we wanted to do and what we wanted to build as a platform. And so I joined Virtual when they just helped to fund one business in Australia. And now the industry itself, up until uh, 31st of December 2020, has successfully raised over $75 million in funds, funded over 118 successful offers. I think the 55,000 investors is so interesting because obviously that's retail and wholesale investors. So everyday people can invest alongside institutions. And, you know, looking at this, when we look at the number of offers which have actually <coughs> raised over a million dollars, I think it's pretty impressive. And since the beginning of this year, it's only grown. And a special mention, I guess, really to Shiba Rideshare, which in March 2019 was the first company to raise $3 million, which set a record, which has now been matched, which I'm going to cover in a little bit. But basically, they had a $1 million investor who came in. So this presented an opportunity for institutional and retail investors to invest alongside each other. And what we've been able to do as a platform and really building up this industry is provide great data for companies who are raising funds at an early stage because if you're really early stage and you might come to us and you might want to raise significant amounts of funds the data is actually showing that it's perhaps not possible to raise three million dollars as a really early stage startup in equity crowdfunding and so what we're really able to do is help companies to raise funds from not only their crowd but also the virtual crowd and really be able to propel the fundraising process as a result and so virtual, I think 2020, everybody can fairly say it was a very challenging year. The beginning, bushfires and then COVID, we really just didn't know how to respond. But in the second half of the year, response was very, very clear. And what it was basically about was early stage startups, they really wanted funding and investors wanted to back Australian businesses. And so as a result, we really just focused and knuckled down, pushed the capabilities of the team itself, and we were able to successfully close 35 offers and raise over $20 million um, for the companies that we were working with. And uh, the, the last six months of the year were <laughs> not fun, but it was all work and it was an amazing achievement for the businesses that we worked with. And so I think the one thing that we've focused on as a result, and when you look at our competitor analysis of how we've managed to achieve this, we've just focused on one product. So we're just purely focused on a business coming to the platform, using the best data that they possibly can and being able to utilize it as best as they can. Obviously, as a team here, you can see I've dressed exactly the same, so you can <laughs> it. Um, but I really do feel like we've built a team which is kind of brought expertise from financial services, legal, tech, and you know, entrepreneurialism. And as a result, it's enabled us to be really flexible and just really relate to the businesses that we're working with. And so when I go through our process, it's really shown to, I, I think, designed for entrepreneurs and early stage startups, because it's not just about raising capital. It's about marketing your business and about getting it on the map. And so we've really designed it so that businesses, when they're going through the setup of putting together a company, it's about the narrative. It's about how you're marketing the business. And it's almost like the first publicity event that a business might be going through and doing this. And also as a result of that, it's really organizing the legals and getting the business into a really clean and easy structure that it can manage moving forward. So the way we've designed the process now, we really feel like it's helping to 
really limit the idea of businesses going out there and trying to raise capital and not having a clue what they're doing. Because in this EOI campaign, which we run, we're you know, basically consolidating all the data. I won't get into it in too much detail. Um, I can bore somebody else with it later if they want to know. Um, but we basically are able to provide a company with a really realistic understanding of what they're likely to raise in the investment offer. And so we've designed the campaign around just being able to be very transparent and be data led. And so that's where we've gotten to this process, which is hopefully very streamlined and makes it uh, nice and easy to work, work through. And I think I couldn't really talk about this process and talk about the companies that we've raised with that without providing some of the, I think, you know, best testimonials as companies and Plunster's Hot Sauce, which is a, a really interesting um, raise because they're a company which is based in Western Australia and Perth. And the way they built that company was completely based around the analogy that they didn't want to do anything as people had traditionally done business. I remember Renee, when she went to an event, she got so bored of people just coming and tasting the hot sauce that she put up a side to just fuck off and take the hot sauce. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked so well, it just went viral. And so when they went to raise funds from their, from their ambassadors, they, everybody loved them because they were so authentic and true to their message. And so Funsters actually absolutely nailed their race and they had a huge, huge, huge amount of coverage through PR and through digital advertising. And so it was really, really successful because they just connected with their audience. Montu was another really interesting raise because this is in the medicinal cannabis industry. They had a really, really strong network of actually doctors who were in the industry here in Melbourne, and a lot of them came on board and invested, and they wouldn't have been able to invest if it wasn't an equity crowdfunding offer, essentially. And well, really, um, they closed this in just a matter of days and hit their maximum target and just absolutely, really just maximized their capabilities as a team. And I think with something like Montu, what you looked at was the fact that they had expertise in digital advertising as well as traditional capital raising, which we really often talk about as being the desired combination to have a successful equity crowdfunding campaign. And then Thrive is a company which has actually just matched the Shiba record for $3 million hit, and they did it in three days. And that was this year. And that has actually marked a point in time in history, which is quite significant to me, but probably not as much so to everybody else. But I'll explain because Thrive actually raised funds through equity crowdfunding and had two VCs come through and a big family office. And if you look back in time in history in the UK, there was a company called Just Heart, which raised funds through equity crowdfunding and had a venture capital firm come through. Now, of course, this isn't always been the case with equity crowdfunding that was first born here in Australia, but that is definitely something which we're seeing now. And as a result, we really hope to change in the future as well. So that really opens up the questions. Next slide. Perfect. <laughs> All right, so as you complete the survey and get your question, I just want to remind the online attendees that you, know, you can use the chat function to ask questions, you know, introduce yourself as well. Uh, you know, with the, we've got Florencia and Sophie in the team uh, managing this, this process uh, and sending me the, the questions so we can all uh, ask the question to, uh, to Robin and all the other all speakers. Thank you. Any any question for Robin? Um, yeah, ask away. Yes. So, do you before you um, come to your services, do you have to have like the idea or the developed your solution or whatever it is to a point where you think like now it's marketable? Yeah. Is is that the point at which you then not before? Yeah. It's look. It's a really good question. Um, generally. It, you've got barriers to entry as a business, the more barriers to entry, the better. Um, but the more that you've built up the brand, the more that you've got your key member, your key advocates for the business itself, the better off you're going to be in when it comes to raising funds because you just have to always think about it from a perspective of an investor. Could they see themselves investing into this? Or would they be able to say, okay, well, actually, you know, I might be able to do this myself with 
just a, a little bit of capital. So it's really important to overcome the initial hurdles, build the initial audience out there, either build IP or have that initial revenue in place. Go ahead. Uh, you've obviously got a couple of really big investors, like a billion dollar investor, but yeah. the, your typical investors on your platform, how much do they invest in Twitch? Um, yeah, the typical investor, uh, when it comes to it, the investors are such a, a huge breakdown of not only investors who are now signed up to the virtual platform, but mainly from the audience of the business and through digital marketing efforts and PR itself and you know through networks. And so the typical investor is actually completely driven by the way in which you market the campaign. Mm -hmm. And so what we saw, uh, you know, I raised funds for um, a, a fantastic little e-commerce e -commerce business called Zerali and their average investment ticket was $700, but that's what they wanted. And so yeah. that's how the offer was designed. And then um, when we did a raise for the Speakeasy group, their raise was very much so geared towards people who are coming in, but they didn't, they didn't want it to be too widely held. And so their average investment size was three and a half thousand dollars. They had a lot of investors who were between fifteen to twenty thousand. So it's very much driven by the wage structure yeah. for the market of the other. So, any more questions? Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry, go ahead. What do you get remunerated? Um, so we we charge um, so for the EOI, which I mentioned just up there, we charge nine hundred dollars for that. Um, and we market the offer, and then we charge a $1,900 admin fee um, for getting the offer live. Essentially, that's our gatekeeper process, um, and we charge a 6% success fee on all funds raised. So if the business isn't successful, we, we don't make any money, essentially, um, because it definitely costs us a lot more than $3,000 to, 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 to get an offer there. Yeah. Sorry, very um, And so what a, what a, like in that case study with the hot sauce, what was she raising? those funds for? What did she have in mind? Did she, like, yeah, what so um, Thumpsters had already gone overseas. They'd already, you know, gotten into a lot of local stores in Australia and they'd already gotten decent coverage on Amazon in the US. So it's really like quite a large proportion was with working capital because it was quite a mature business. Um, right. And it was working capital to be able to, to go out there and, and speak to other um, suppliers and get other you know, offers in, in, in place, basically. It, it really depends, but Monsters was definitely a case whereby they'd already built a business, which was doing fine for the founders, but they really wanted to scale because, especially in the US, where it was a much more competitive market, they were really seeing that they needed the capital to be able to, if they were going to market the, uh, the business heavily, they needed the cash behind them to be able to fulfill all this very quickly. Okay, for the wrapping it up, I mean, if you uh, yeah, want to know more, feel free to see Robin at the, uh, at the end of the event during the networking section. And we'll get to uh, hear from uh, one of the company uh, on the virtual platform uh, a bit later on during the, the, the pitch part. So thank you so much, Robin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, and now we'll have uh, Joe from uh, Fun Square joining us. Welcome, Joe. Hi, Brian. Uh, as Leo said, my name's Joel. I'm from Fun Square. Uh, before I get started, I just wanted to do a couple of shout outs. Uh, thanks to Sarp and Angels for putting on the event. It's great to be able to do events like this again in person. Um, and thanks to um, Blue Rock for hosting the event. Uh, great partner of ours, so, so it's good to be able to do the event together. Um, and thanks for everyone else for coming out. It's uh, good to see so many people here. Uh, Melbourne has such a great startup scene, and it's great to be part of that. Um, so, fun score. Uh, a big question, actually. We're going to do my question analog. So sorry, I haven't signed up for the app. So just quick raising of hands. Um, not a trick question for the startup founders and startup employees in the room. So who here thinks that their business has the potential to be a uh, uh, It was a trick question, but only for my founder, if he didn't raise his hand. How many people raised their hand? What if you actually? <laughs> 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 
Um, I'll come back to why that's important later. Um, but uh, so funds for what we do is we provide non-diluted growth capital to startups and innovators um, from seed stage through to public listed businesses. So uh, how we do that is through two products that I'm going to be talking about today, which is an R&D finance product and a revenue-based finance product. So we work with businesses across a lot of different industries, from SaaS to pharmaceutical businesses, from ag tech to D tech. You name it, we've probably worked with a different business in an industry. Um, and we also leverage a lot of tech ourselves. So uh, we have a digital application process and we're leveraging a lot of open banking data. Uh, and we have the proprietary algorithms that we've developed in our credit decision process as well. Um, and we obviously operate in the ANZ region, the UK and Canada as well. Uh, so my role, I am in the sales and service department for the ANZ region, but I also uh, work with a lot of our key partners in that region as well. So these are the key stages that businesses usually work with us through. So uh, the early stage is usually businesses that are spending more than 300,000 on research and development. Small team, but heavy R&D because they're trying to get that product to market. And um, a, a lot of potential in working towards getting that product out there so they can get their first revenues and get traction going. So the second stage is the emerging stage. So this is probably the most common stage that we work with a lot of businesses in. So that's pre-series A, post-seed, uh, pre-series B, you've usually got a few VCs on the cap table. Uh, they've, they've got their product in market and they're getting their first revenue and they're getting traction um, and the, the team is growing. And then there's the established stage. So that's the more mature end of the clients that we work with. So they're either um, large tech businesses that are getting great traction and a lot of revenue or they are publicly listed businesses that are heavy R&D like pharmaceutical businesses and stuff like that. And uh, if they're not listed, they've got quite a diverse funding mix of debt and equity and a, quite a large cap table. Um, yeah, and uh, growing the revenues if they're if they're in that in the tech space. So these are a few of the use cases that people would use debt or fund squire. Um, so the, I guess the key overarching theme is that we allow businesses to get growth capital into their business without having to sacrifice on equity or dilute their their equity position. So uh, we do that through a few different ways. So the R&D finance product, uh, we allow businesses to leverage their R&D tax credit earlier than when the tax is going to be paid. And then uh, businesses usually use that to they invest in the R&D increase the credit. But I'll go into a bit more detail on that in a second. The other way is uh, using the R&D finance product or the revenue-based finance to, uh, to delay a capital raise or not raise as much as they need to. So if a business is going for a 2 million capital raise, they might only raise uh, 1.5 and then they know they're going to use that 1.5 on R&D. So that means they can get a facility from us at 500 grand and that means their total raise has been 2 million and they haven't had to sacrifice on selling the whole equity position for the 2 million. So I get asked a lot from businesses, why would I take on debt at such an early stage as opposed to raising <coughs> capital? from external sources. So uh, I don't think this idea or graph will be new to anyone in the room is that uh, equity may seem like the cheaper option today, but when you sell equity and then five or 10 years time, when you're 10 times, 100 times bigger than what you were when you sold it, that, that equity can really add up. Um, and I guess that comes back to the question at the beginning why I asked, and so many people raise their hand why they think they're gonna be a unicorn. If we can help you to hold on to one or two percent of equity today, that's ten or twenty million dollars when you're in, when you're a unicorn. So the R and D finance product. So this is a uh, basic overview of that R and D finance product, right? So uh, actually, before I get into that, who has heard of the R and D tax incentive? Yeah, quite a few people. Okay. So for those of you who didn't raise your hands. Blue Rocker, a great R&D tax advisor, <laughs> and uh, Tom's in the room somewhere, so you can find him after. Um, and who has heard of R&D finance before? Yeah, okay, less people interested. Um, so basically, as I said before, what we do is we work with the business, we work with the R&D advisor to find out what the 
accrued R&D tax credit is, and we allow the business to leverage 80% of that accrued R&D tax credit today. So they can invest in their team today, uh, increase their speed market, um, and then we allow them to draw down on a monthly basis as they continue to spend more money on R&D. So it's like a line of credit that increases as you spend more money. Um, and this is a typical example of a, of a business that we could work with. So the R&D expenditure with funds to and without. So this business is obviously planning to spend a uh, million dollars on R&D. That's an R&D credit of 435,000, which is a facility from us of 350,000. So what the business will usually do is they'll get in contact with us when they're banked up a, an amount of credit they want to leverage. And they'll know that they're going to spend our money on more R&D. So over the course of the year, their R&D budget goes from 1 million to 1.35. Their R&D credit goes from 435 to 580. And this is our revenue-based finance product. So who's heard of revenue-based finance? Yeah, less hands than the R&D finance, okay. Um, okay, so the way this works is uh, uh, we work with the business to understand what their average monthly recurring revenue is. We work out uh, what the finance fee should be for that. It's very flexible and very collaborative. And then we work out what amount of future revenue should go towards repaying that facility. So in this example, uh, this business is uh, averaging $15,000 of monthly recurring revenue. So we'll agree with that business that we'll give them $45,000 being three months of their monthly recurring revenue. We'll then agree that 20% uh, of future revenue goes towards repaying our facility. And we might agree that $5,000 is the financing fee. So the amount they repay us is 50,000. So then over the course of the next month, as the, their revenue comes in, they repay our facility and the 20% on top goes to us. But the interesting part is that the goals and the outcomes and the objectives are aligned between us and the business because we're only taking the 20%. So you only ever pay that $5,000 facility fee or financing fee, regardless if you pay it in two weeks or two years. So in this example, the business had a down month, but that doesn't matter because they're not penalised for that because they're only paying the 20% of what that revenue is anyway. Um, and then at the end, we would work out uh, what the new average recurring revenue is and we give that business the option to take up a new facility. So in this example, we'll say 25,000 is their new average. We'll give them an option to do four months of 25,000. So we'll give them a $100,000 facility. That's it. Um, questions? Yeah. How much like interest do you guys charge on those facilities? Yeah, so we usually average between like five and ten percent. Yeah, depending on some risk profiles. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, what's the proportion of um, customers which are day policy? Yeah, so we don't, we haven't really had anyone that have defaulted, especially around the, the R&D product, because we work with really good R&D advisors, so we know the R&D asset, we've been doing it for six years, um, so we've never had to enforce on a business in that situation, we only have security over the R&D asset anyway, we don't take any personal guarantees or anything like that, um, and with the revenue based products, um, we don't take any security at all, so we take security over the receivables, but if it takes five years to repay you, that just means that um, just means it takes five years. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. With financing your your funds. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a really good relationship with a big uh, fund in, out of London. Um, they are really experienced. They've been doing this kind of thing for sixty years, providing debt warehouses to to people who are providing debt to businesses, and they've seen. They've seen everything, they've seen downturns and everything like that. And um, yeah, we have a really good relationship with them. Five to 10% interest rate seems to be very low. So yeah, so I, it, I understand for the, for the, the tax issue, but the, this revenue financing seems to be very low. Yeah, so I mean, that's that's what we target for the, the, the percentage, but again, it depends on the specific circumstances of the business, and uh, obviously it's case by case. Yeah. No other questions? Awesome. All Thank right. you very much. Thank you so much.
well and let you vote. I'm just uh, a knowledge for uh, online attendees. Say sorry, the, the phone went on low battery mode, so you lost the image for, for a while, uh, but we'll find a way to, uh, to recharge it. Uh, and you, I think you, you, you heard that you didn't miss anything from what you said, so that's right. Um, But yeah, we did we did a similar survey in the in the room. Most people knew about the RD uh, loans, but not the refinancing. Yeah. I think there's a question in the oh. on the room. The, the notification was okay, we didn't miss the voice. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, good. All right. Sixty percent knew about RD loans before today. I know we'll get into the pitch section and welcome Tim from Project Block. Welcome, Tim. Are you questioning Charlie? Yes, I'm actually really keen to know this from everyone. A quick show of hands is how many people are here commuting to work or maybe commuting to the shops and that sort of thing? Community in any regard. In any regard, yeah, yeah. Um, any people sort of getting a little bit further afield on the weekend, maybe for recreational rides or group rides and that sort of thing? Cool. Nice. Probably okay to proceed to the next yeah. slide. Yeah. <laughs> so I've been a passionate cyclist for the last sort of 10 years or so. Um, during that time, I've actually been witness to a couple of pretty serious cycling accidents. Unfortunately, I've been in a couple myself also. Uh, more recently, with my work with Project Flock, I've heard many stories from uh, fellow cyclists that involve injury and unfortunately the death of fellow cyclists. Getting outside to jump on your bike, whether it's commuting to work or going on a recreational ride, it just shouldn't be so life threatening. My name is Tim Ottaway. I'm the uh, co-founder and managing director of Project Flock, and I believe we can play a really big part in improving safety for riders in the future. So, forty thousand cyclist deaths globally in 2018. That's that's World Health Organization statistics. In Australia, a really really high percentage of cyclists are getting hit and killed by cars. So, what's happening to combat that? Infrastructure, policy, and edu education, these are all the long-term solutions, and, and not to take away from that, but they're all long-term solutions in order to bring that very trauma statistic down for cyclists. The big question I'd like to ask, and what we really interrogate with Project Flock, is what can be done right now? What can be done on a day-to-day -day basis to make riding safer for cyclists? So one of the best short-term solutions for making for preventing cyclist injury and um, casualties is to make them more conspicuous, more recognizable out on the roads and paths. And one of the best ways to do that is through bike lights, making them more conspicuous with a flashing red light, for example. The big problem though with bike lights, particularly the tower lights I'm talking about here, is that they are focused on making the light the center of attention, not the cyclist. They're getting so powerful that they're tending to startle and blind a lot of road users. So right now, the cycling industry, the cycling market, I mean, since last year in particular, it's undergone immense growth and they have a lot of projected growth. So there's this really tremendous opportunity to provide a bike light which better responds to cyclists, but also to be a company that contributes to the long-term safety, uh, contributes to those things I mentioned in the first slides there. So if the um, you know, participation rates have been growing so rapidly, the bike light that better serves cyclists is needed more than ever in the short term so we can make cycling safer day to day. So 
project clock, we have created a bike light which puts this the rider at the center of attention. So they're not just another flashing red light. Anymore. So how it works is by highlighting the biomotion, by highlighting the moving legs of the cyclist at nighttime and in low light situations when they're most vulnerable, they can be seen. This is what research says. They can be seen up to five and a half times soon. What Project Flock have done is we've created a project that uses biomotion light, a product that um, uses biomotion lighting technology to light up the moving legs of the rider while they're riding so they can be seen sooner and they can be seen sooner. So we launched an MVP concept last October and we've been working really, really hard to take that product to market. <coughs> So who are we trying to sell this bike light to when it's ready to, sell, to go to market? We're targeting the cycling enthusiast initially through an e-commerce direct-to-customer platform. And then we want to move, we want to scale and move into those other customer segments to sit up on the slide there. And of course, really importantly, our biomachine technology is also really good to move into other sectors and into other industries and markets. So, I want to make it really clear here, a bike ride is not going to solve cycling safety issues. <laughs> and that's why it's really important to, 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 to mention that we're profit and purpose driven. Okay, so we want to be a, uh, a, a company that can provide innovative cycling uh, related and micro mobility related des um, design products, but also be a company that is contributing to the long term safety of riders and vulnerable road users. So, you know, for example, the partnerships, partnering with cycling safety organizations is a really key for us. We've already, already started having conversations with some of those organizations. So last year was um, when we launched the business back in May of 2020. We've been working really hard as far back as 2019. And we were recognized, we um, were awarded the James Dyson Award for Australia last year, and we we're also the runner up in the sports and recreation category of the 477 design which is also global sustainable. As I said, since launching the business in May of 2020, we've had some reasonably healthy signs of, of traction. We have seen 150, more than 150 customers that had shown strong buying intentions since we launched that MVP concept in uh, October of last year. So uh, also in 2020, lots of things happened in 2020. Um, we were, took part in the Launch Hub Pre Accelerated Program that RMIT activated. That. And that was from about I think July to uh, through to August through to October. And that was a really, really crucial stepping stone for us. Um, after going through that program, we had the opportunity to pitch to the Activated Capital Fund Board, and we succeeded in getting some funding. And it's been so crucial to have that funding to continue on our journey through to now. Also, too, more recently, um, I've been working with a couple of designers here. Um, Kim's here tonight. We've been doing lots of great work together. We've also been partnering with Cobalt Design. These uh, ladies and gentlemen are amazing designers, good design award winners, um, uh, multiple years in a row. We've been partnering with them to try and make the clock light, the, the, our biomotion lighting technology, as best as we can for, uh, for our customers. And a really big thing here is we couldn't have gotten this far without a really strong team. We've got some of the team here tonight. I'd like to introduce some of you to if, you, if you'd like to come and have a chat about Project Block. But I think it's just worth noting here that we are a, a team that's very design driven. We're very interested in uh, what is going to benefit the user. And we're really interested in how we can affect improving safety for cyclists and micro mobility in the future. So this is the last slide. Um, I just want to let everyone know Project Block are seeking partners and collaborators. We're really wanting to, as you saw from one of those earlier slides, we're needing some help in scaling our community. We've got a great message, we've got a great product, we need to scale our community. Growing partnerships is um, a very, very important mission for us. And finally, um, we, we would like to explore some funding to afford the tooling and production costs that we're going to have in the future, taking the product to customers. Thanks so much, everyone. I uh, appreciate you having lots of attention tonight and look forward to some chats later on. Thank you. All right, maybe time for one question. Um, what kind of IP controls have you got around the light design to stop 
one of your competitors going, that's a great idea, let's point lights that way. Yeah, yeah. We, we do have a, um, a provisional patent on our biomotion lighting technology. Um, we're working with a patent lawyer up in Sydney. But yeah, it's, it's a really great point. It's a hardware product. It's, you know, it's relatively easy to just put some lights and point them the right way. We're really looking to make our product more defensible through growing a strong community and partnering with cycling safety organizations. Where are you selling right now? Or are you kind of in pre-production? Correct. Yeah. Well, we're in pre-production. We have our website. Um, it's projectblock.cc if anyone would like to visit. We have got some imagery of what the product looks like. But yeah, we're, we're getting very close to uh, a prototype that we want to be able to be testing with users. And uh, yeah, it's just about getting those funds together for you get the moving tool and really producing the scale. Have you considered a Kickstarter like campaign for the product? Very strong, very strong. Uh, a Kickstarter campaign is definitely in the works. Um, I think it's really our strategy is about scaling up that community so we can have a strong pre launch campaign. <coughs> so our funding chances uh, you know, are much higher than. Good. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you it. Thanks, everyone. All right. Now we're going to get uh, Gus to come and, and present. Welcome, Gus. Hi, guys. That's tough. I've got to present now after, you know, purpose led business that's looking to save lives. Um, so, listen, thanks for, uh, thanks for uh, inviting us uh, to come along and present. Um, I'd order those that are online as well. So back in early 2018, I was literally working two floors down on uh, level 15. I just joined Blue Rock. Um, it's the Staten Analytics Division, which was going to go alongside all of these other amazing entrepreneurial advisory businesses. Uh, one of the first meetings, though, that I had was with uh, another director who was here, um, Cal Cameron. He sort of pulled me aside and said, listen, I'm doing this placemaking stuff. I'm working for this business, uh, the, this company that owns a large commercial office building. It's the Telstra head office building up on Exhibition Street. And what I need to do for them is uh, create this retail strategy. And it's basically going to tell them what type of retail to put into the ground floor of that particular building. Because they were going to rip it, rip out the guts and do the, the, the lobby again. He said to me, do you think you can do that thing with sort of maths and data where you can create a model that can kind of help me work out what type of retail we should put in there to sort of support this strategy that I'm doing? And I went, no. <laughs> <laughs> I know a guy and he's just over there. There's John. So I, uh, I got John, who's our director of data science. Um, move on. But John, who's our director of data science, uh, to come in and together we sat down over three months and basically <coughs> smashed together this uh, machine learning AI model that analyzed a whole bunch of different trade areas and came back with recommendations on what was in oversupply and un undersupply for that area just around that particular building. You know, should they have been looking at pharmacy or health and wellness? How much food and beverage was there? Um, and really, that became the start of. You know, the, the exciting and somewhat stressful journey into the geospatial analytics for, for the business. Um, so since then, you know, Cal has, has joined as our, our sales director. Peter, who's been heavily involved and was the founder of, of Blue Rock, uh, has sort of come in as, as the chairman of the business. And we've now got a, uh, a growing team of data scientists that are basically working with us. So what exactly are we doing though? We're trying to solve problems around, you know, really complex property decisions that at the moment are really being done with quite limited information. So a lot of these buildings that you see out here are worth hundreds of millions of dollars when they're actually developed. And there's a lot of decisions though that are being made with, you know, you'd be surprised at how much intuition, gut feel, you know, experience is being used in terms of the actual design of those buildings, particularly sort of what's happening down the ground floor. And so some of the, the areas that, you know, we saw where that were sort of being underserved were, you know, 
who are the current or target customers for that particular asset? When you hear asset, it means a building or a piece of dirt. <coughs> you know, how, how are, are those particular users using that particular location? And what are their needs and preferences? How do you build a building that's going to serve the people that you think are actually going to actually work in it and spend a lot of their working, uh, working week in? And what type of services are, uh, are going to be optimal for that particular property, given the, the sort of trade or the catchment area around it? And what are the sort of the, the demand and supply dynamics? Well, you know, you don't want to put something into this building if there's already so much of it in the area that uh, that particular business may actually sort of fail. Their type of business. And the last one, which is quite a tricky area, tricky one, is how is that area going to change over time? And so that's something we've been doing a lot of thinking about ourselves. So what did we do? We basically set out to create a business that was going to use a whole bunch of geospatial expertise coupled with broad data sets. So a lot of data that wasn't being used by the traditional sort of market research firms and consultants. Uh, we were going to actually apply predictive analytics and use a, try and use a whole bunch of AI to answer questions that sort of hadn't been answered before today. So really, that, these were the what we see as our key differentiator, differentiators. And finally, and this is really what's been sort of the you know the last twelve months and the hard slog for us was we we're going to build a platform to automate it all, um, and really try and reduce those time to insights. So that rather than getting a consultant to come in who's going to take four to six weeks to write your report about something, we're going to do it in. Four weeks and then it's got down to two weeks and soon it'll be one week then we'll talk days and, and hours but really for us you know that is uh you know that is sort of our, our, our particular goal but you know our product at the moment is still a report because that's what our customers want uh it's what they're used to a lot of these property guys are uh um quite ingrained in in uh you know the, the, the way they, they see things being done but we have actually developed an app now. And so, you know, this is just sort of one sort of screenshot uh, of our particular application. And, you know, it's, it's probably a little bit hard to read that, you know, what we've done is we've geofenced. So I've literally drawn a, a polygon around Fed Square and using a whole bunch of de identified mobile data that we have sitting within our application, we can sort of see where the hotspots are in terms of where people are going. What the application can also do is say for all of these visitors to this particular area kind of approximately where do they live you know what are their demographics what are their psychographics which is sort of a way of talking about what are their ha habits attitudes and beliefs so what we're trying to do is give anyone whether it's someone who's looking after a large retail precinct someone who owns a large commercial office building someone who owns a shopping center someone who wants to build a large residential development, information and insights that they haven't been able to, to, to get before. We do a whole bunch of other stuff too, but anyway, we'll talk about another that. So results today. So last financial year, we did 1.2 million. This year, we're not gonna do as well because we got smashed by COVID last year because our core market at that time was people that, owned and operated large commercial office buildings. And last year, a lot of them were pretty empty. And a lot of people weren't actually doing any planning. They were just sort of sitting on their hands in terms of you know, any of that sort of stuff. But what it forced us to do was actually go out and find new customers. So we started working with, I know there's lots of logos here, <laughs> many of which you wouldn't recognize. I didn't know them before I started, but you might've heard of someone like Murda, um, you know, this large property developer. So, you know, we started working with them on residential development. So we've sort of now expanded our, our capabilities beyond just commercial buildings to these residential develop, developments. And now we're starting to move into other areas like uh, local councils. We've started to do work in the retail space. And really that's where going back to, you know, how is revenue growth going to go? For us, it's been about the fact that you know, what, what used to be done with analysts sort of writing code, running queries, um, and then dropping that into to reports is now our guys jumping onto an application and a platform, putting in an address, 
uh, pushing the button, getting the insights, getting them into a report. And now we're starting to actually be able to expand the capabilities of that platform to be able to serve these other, these other market segments as well. So yeah, commercial, resi, communities, retail development, retail island. But sort of the vision for our platform is that, you know, it, it kind of becomes this location intelligence platform that can be used by anyone who wants to understand anything about a, a particular location. Last slide. So we're out there asking for money at the moment. That's why I'm here. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and we're doing okay. We actually had a good week this week. Um, but uh, you know, we are we are looking to to raise another 1.8 million minimum investment of 100k. But you know, we're we're talking to other people who, who, who if that's a bit the check size is still a little bit large for them. And really, what we're going to be using that for is sort of tech development. You know, more R&D spend there. Um, we've got some uh, some allocated to bolster our, our sales force and, and to actually get involved in some marketing. Because you know, to date, we have literally spent zero dollars on marketing, apart from a, a nice website. Um, so the rest is going into, into working capital. So uh, for anyone that is, that is interested, happy to, to take your details, organize a meeting, Run a platform demo for you next week, week after. But um, I think that's us. So, uh, yeah, thanks for your time, guys. Where's James? Any more questions? <laughs> what did you think of this pitch? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you mentioned about certain having certain. Um, information about a certain demographic of people in a certain area. How do you how do you get that data? So, I take forty five minutes for explaining. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we, we we've got a whole bunch of de-identified mobile data that, that we purchase. Yeah. Um, what we will do is we could geofence this this particular building. We get a whole bunch of devices, mm -hmm. um, and basically, you know, we can run some AI over that and say, who are the workers? Who are the visitors? Um, you know, potentially, you know, if there's residents who are the rent. What we also have for those particular devices is where else they've gone. Like I said, we don't know where they are, but what we do have is an approximate home location. It's not a street name. It's not a street number, anything like that. It's, it's actually randomised. You know, we asked the vendor to do that for us from a data privacy perspective. But once we know where you live, we can start to actually tag you <laughs> <laughs> approximately. Yeah, I was kind of interested from the security yeah. perspective. How it's that's fairly accessible, though. Sorry? That's fairly accessible. It's no. Correct. Yeah. Like, and th there is other people using this data to do a whole bunch of stuff around pushing you notifications yeah. because you went into a BMW car lot and you'll get a BMW ad pushed out to your yeah. phone. And there's some yeah. creepy stuff going on. You know, what we always tell our clients is that. All of the data we use gets aggregated. We don't follow individuals. We don't want to because the insights we're giving you are only valuable yeah. when they're aggregated up to a certain yeah. level. Oh, no, sorry, I wasn't. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Just insight. Yeah. Don't worry. So who is it? You're interested. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's, yeah, it's, 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 quite, it comes up all the time. You know, being an analytics company, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, we're, we're very conscious of, and it's all about using the data ethically. Yep. Anyway, there's another question. So, how do you charge your customer? What's your revenue model? That's one question. And the other question do you have any competitor? Yeah. Uh, sense of competition globally or, sure. or in a standard? So, we we basically charge, charge for reports. So, and it, it typically varies, depends. Typically on the size of the project, and to be honest, you know the the, the budget, the, the appetite that the, the particular companies have. If, you know, for a, you know, we did a job for a particular large commercial office building, and I don't know, Cal might be able to tell us, but I imagine they're probably spending about seven hundred million, and we charge them thirty five grand. Um, you know, we do we've done some custom work that's been actually sort of a lot larger than that, but we're also doing small jobs where we might only charge five thousand, ten thousand dollars. So. Um, as I've been told by a, a number of founders from different businesses, pricing is always being tweaked. You never quite get it right. 
you know, but for us, it's 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 at the moment it's 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 fees that are paid paid uh, based on uh, or reports that are ordered. So what was the second question? Competition. Competition. Um, so I have done some some analysis on this. There's there is some companies that you know that do use this mobile data as well that have started to enter the market. They're not doing some of the stuff we're doing where they're tagging that data with psychographic profiles and they're not able to understand how people are traveling versus staying, stuff like that. Um, but apart from that, you know, the only other sort of real competitors we have in the market are um, research companies, like there's a company called Urbis, who are probably our biggest competitor at the moment, who've almost had this monopoly on uh, providing market research into large property companies. They were kind of the, the, the default uh, prior, to our, prior to us being here. Um, there's some companies like Neighbourlytics, there's some data businesses, but um, we really, we're not, we don't see ourselves as a data business, we're an analytics business. So we take the data, we, uh, we synthesize it, we clean it, we model it, simulate it, visualize it. You know, it's, you know, that's really our expertise and our IP is really around taking these data sets. And so a lot of the time we get asked, oh, do you have exclusivity over any of your data? Um, you know, what's to stop other people doing what you're doing? You know, we, we've actually purposely gone out and for most of the data we get, made sure that we've got at least one source for it. So there's, you know, there's no chance for a single supplier to somehow kind of leverage us. Um, but yeah, you know, for us, it's it's the algorithms, it's the code that we're writing that's actually taking that data and doing things with it, whether it's predictive or like. All right, one thing, I think, I think, I think we're gonna, yeah. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Adam. Thanks. Well done. Yeah. Uh, started pitching, but not least. James, let's go. Switching here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hey guys, I'm James, and um, with my wife, well, we have some questions. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with some questions. Yeah. No, tell us oh. about you. You can leave us this slide as long as we as possible, so we can all vote. But like, tell us a bit more about about you. Yeah, so I'm I'm James, and with my wife Eliza, we create delicious products that make people smile. Um, you probably can tell from the shirt, it's pickles. Um, so we run a family business here in Melbourne. Um, over a little over two years ago, we started selling pickles at local farmers markets on the Mornington Peninsula. Um, and you fast forward two and a half years, and now we're in restaurants and retailers all across Australia, including Costco nationwide. So this is one of our delicious pickles. And what we found out from thousands of customers is that pickles are incredibly polarizing. <laughs> <laughs> Take my wife and me as a perfect example. I grew up in America, grew up eating pickles since I was about two, and it's been my favorite food ever since I was two. My wife grew up in Australia and hated pickles <laughs> until two and a half years ago. And the reason that she started liking pickles is because we started making pickles. Our range has grown from those first farmers markets and now we do pickles for the home and pickles for commercial kitchens, different flavors, different cuts. And people absolutely love them, including Matt Preston from MasterChef. <laughs> so what makes our pickles so good? Well, they make people smile for all the right reasons. They're proudly Australian made. They're super authentic to what I grew up with. And most importantly, for a lot of people, they have no added sugar in them. So they're super healthy, which is really important to my wife because she's a dietitian and lectures at Monash University on dietetics. So what have we done? Well, in last year, we made over 200,000 kilos of pickles for Australia. And this year, we'll make over half a million kilos of pickles for Australia. 
And in just two and a half years, we've become the third largest Australian producer of pickles in Australia. <clears throat> so what are we gonna do going forward? Well, we're working on deals with some other major supermarkets here in Australia and overseas. And in order for us to do that, we need to scale up our productions. Right now we have a small uh, 300 square meter warehouse and we pack everything by hand. To be able to handle some of the deals that we're working on, that's not gonna work. We need to be able to produce a whole lot more pickles. And so later this year, this financial year, with virtual, we're actually gonna run an EOI campaign to see if we can raise the funds through virtual to actually help us scaling our business and building a brinery. How cool a name is that? <laughs> and what we're gonna do in that is we're gonna to continue to make the awesome pickles that we already make, but we're also gonna grow that category into brine infused condiments. So our first one, which we launched in about four weeks is Get Saucy, which is a line of hot sauces. And um, the, the two major uh, supermarkets that we're talking to at the moment are Coles here in Australia, at, which we've actually launched into Coles Local in the last few months, and um, Countdown in New Zealand. So what I'm asking for today is if you're interested in pickles, pull out your phone, get on that QR code, or go to our website later and use the code Dilly Deal, and we'll give you a 50% discount on one of our three packs, which is our mo most popular product on our website. Um, and you can buy it for $20 plus shipping. Um, love to know what you think. Um, we'd love for you to get in touch and tell us more about, um, there's a lot of detail to what I've just done in um, probably four and a half minutes. Um, we've done a lot, we're going to do a lot, um, but we'd really, really love for you guys to get in touch. Any questions? I'll go back to that because it's probably more important. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Not for you. Yeah. As a uh, fellow Native American, <laughs> I have to ask what part you're from because I need to know <laughs> if, if, if they're real pickles. <laughs> well, I'm from Virginia. Okay. Um, so that's, uh, that's you know funny. one state north yeah. from the largest producing pickle state in the country, um, with Mount Olive. Um, but I grew up eating deli pickles in New York, where my mom's from, and uh, Massachusetts, where my dad's from. So you, you passed the test. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, this is more of a statement than anything else. <clears throat> About three months ago, I tried their spicy pickles. Yeah. And I seriously have a comment. I'm not joking. They are really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, how's the market growing? Because, I mean, you said you grew to the third largest in Australia. Obviously, pickles are not as big here as they are in America, as reflected in yep. that relationship. Um, how are you going at growing the market and what's your plan to grow the market? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, as you said, it, it's not big in Australia, but globally it's a 14, last year it was a $14 billion industry. Here in Australia, it's about 50,000 kilos of pickles that are sold each week. Um, so it's still a fairly big thing and we're cutting into that market share. But the biggest thing that I think is on trend and I think it's a continuing on trend, um, I guess, uh, trend, sorry. <laughs> um, is that people are looking for simple, healthy foods. And a lot of those simple and healthy foods are being imported because to make them healthy or simple and, and not divide that, they have to be made cheap for people to eat them. And so Australian manufacturing of food is going away. And so what I like to, I don't think of us as an innovative business because pickles are really, really old. However, what I like to think of us as being innovative is bringing Australian food manufacturing back to Australia. And what we're doing is showcasing people that simple, can meet all of the things that people are going out and making a you know 50 ingredient product to bring that to you, or you can just eat a cucumber. <laughs> <laughs> yes. A uh, bit of a silly question, but I noticed that uh, one of your partners slash um, customers is Hoyt. So you selling to like 
as a cinema staff? Yeah, so we <laughs> distribute all of our, 94% of our business is distributing through a distributor. Yeah. And so a lot of our food service goes directly. So they're being used in burgers at yeah. points. Oh, right. um, yeah. So we've got a lot of commercial customers. 60% of our volumes are with our commercial um, commercial customers. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. But interestingly enough, I mean, in, in terms of trajectory, um, there I won't, I can't name the name, but I can say that a person who takes up fifty percent of the shelf space in a supermarket contacted me three weeks ago because they wanted us to produce an Australian pickle for them. So they're the king of pickles in Australia. They import all their pickles, and they're looking for an Australian. One of the um, one of the managers there has tasted the pickles from a farmer's market and said, "Like." God, we gotta get on these. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Awesome. Thanks so much. Oh, yeah. Do you know how you call a picker in French? <laughs> That's it. <Yeah. laughs> We'll probably go through, uh, through this one, but if you're interested, go and find uh, James. And our last but not least final presentation with uh, Yan Ling from OVH Cloud. Welcome, Yan Ling. Thank Welcome you. back. Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. And we've, um, we've been partnered with uh, Stellar Engine for the past two years. And we're glad to be here again physically. Pre COVID, we were here uh, last March and now we're back again. It's so good to see the vibe of the, the whole uh, in person networking. Yeah, before I go into the detail of the startup program, uh, maybe it's just an uh, introduction about myself. Um, I work for OVH Club Startup Program Team in Asia Pacific, a base in Melbourne office here. And we have a team sales digital marketing here. Uh, marketing team here in uh, Melbourne office. Then we have our technical team that running the data centers based in Sydney and having uh, uh, um, uh, offices around the globe as well and in Singapore and in India for the whole Asia Pacific market. So before I go into the detail of uh, the um, startup program that we offer for startup and also scale out, I would like to take a little bit of time to talk about cloud computing strategy I guess most of you already mm -hmm. on the cloud, uh, directly, indirectly, whether to build your solutions, um, for the customer, and so forth. So this, um, just allow me to actually um, maybe bring you through that some considerations that need to actually look into, perhaps if you're early stage startup, that this will be something that you're actually asking yourself or your CTO or as founders, you want to know that, okay, depends on what are your businesses, what are the solutions that you're building? Is it the traditional legacy uh, solutions that more make sense that to be done on the parameter service, on-premise kind of environment, or is actually a cloud native application? Then next question we'll bring to is whether, is it a very high sensitive data that you're hosting? Are you actually hosting a health data? financial data, personal data, depends the sensitivity and also the nature of the business, then you would like to run it on the private cloud, which is more control. Uh, you will actually, all the rest will be more onto the public cloud that allows you to have more flexibility in terms of scalable and, and uh, paid as you go kind of models. Then thirdly, also we we'll talk about multi-cloud and hybrid cloud, I'm not sure, or most of you already on some kind of cloud. Uh, are you actually on the single cloud kind of environment or are you actually into a multi-cloud with multiple providers? Is your provider allows you to actually run your solutions on multi-cloud? Based on uh, Fraxera Cloud of State uh, reports last year, like 93% of the enterprises actually embrace the multi-cloud um, architectures and also the hybrid cloud. So it depends on your architectures as well, probably these are areas that you have to actually take into consideration and think of that. Is the provider or is the architectures that you are adopting allows you to have that kind of flexibility and for the long-term scalability and the um, agilities that you are actually building, all right? And then is it some things that 
um, based on open source or is uh, in a very proprietary environment that will kind of give you kind of the um, uh, trap, not very trap, but it is, is it going to lock you in and you have to be, rely on single provider that you have no choice whenever they change the models or the pricing, you just have to adapt. And, and follow through, or you have the open uh, flexibility and freedom to actually build based on open source <clears throat> and then allow you to actually reverse or at scale, upscale or downscale as a startup. It is important, like last year, COVID hit, and when started, we get a lot of startups start to think of okay, what should we do for enterprises or entrepreneurs? They're talking to think that, oh, okay. I cannot continue with my business model. I do have to pivot and make the change, right? Go to whether if you are from the retail, you go to e-commerce, or go online and to get the customer, to get the, the more uh, uh, accessibility from your customer and so forth. So all this will actually bring into the consideration when building your architecture in the technology space, all right? So that, that's what perhaps you can think about it is what you're doing now allows you to actually take all the boxes and other piece considerations as well that you have to look into. Performance of your computer, of your servers is very important, but nobody likes bail shock, like environment. Do I understand my bail? What I'm paying for? All right, do you, do you actually uh, have the visibilities on actually what you charge, especially in the cloud that is the provider charge you for, for the ingress? Egress, is it come with unlimited bandwidth? The data, uh, the transfer, how is it being actually appear or presented on to your bill? So these are the things that as a startup with a very tight cash flow, you want to be very careful in managing this. We, we like a couple of years ago, there was a report about uh, one of the uh, well-known social media uh, platform. They've been actually paid more than what they actually get from their revenue. This is shocking. This shouldn't be the case to running a business. You need to control your cost and your budget as well. So think of that cost versus performance. Is it included um, uh, the very important uh, elements of that? Given the antivirus production, is it part of the bill? Or you have to actually top up uh, on a, a, a budget just for a uh, the one elements of that. And then again, free from when the lock in I mentioned about um, you don't want to be actually feel trapped and also locked in one particular vendors that not allows you to actually even to pivot and even scale down or reverse from the infrastructure that move forward because of the change of your business nature. That those are the areas that perhaps you want to consider. And you have the freedom to where you store your data, right? Where your data uh, being stored, how you manage it. Do you have a single console to manage um, your servers? And also think about data sovereignty and data protections. If today, for instance, you now you are doing business in Australia, but you are move, you want to scale one day to Europe market, right? then. Is your solutions or is your infrastructure compliance with GDPR? Um, okay, that's one of the areas that perhaps you know, maybe not for your business, but how about your customer that actually you are serving? Are they need to be GDPR compliance or are they subject to other um, cloud act by different countries, different nature? Then how are you going to make sure that your infrastructures will be able to actually um, uh, cover all those uh, compliance need and registrations that you need to be, uh, whether locally or whether globally, that you are trying to go to. Right? And also, last but not least, consider about the certifications. They are providers that will be able to give you. If you are holding um, health data, perhaps you need to think of that the certification and compliance that allows you to host the health data for your customer or your consumer or your users, yeah, or financial data. So what kind of certification you are looking for? So those are the considerations when running and creating your cloud strategy. 
um, regardless of uh, native or regardless of um, the more traditional bimetal services or postcard, 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 postcard. Any questions? I don't have uh, any polling questions for you guys, but feel free to ask me later. Yeah, or we can chat later. So now we come to the program itself. That why we supporting the startup. Um, before OVH Cloud became an became an international company, we were um, startup before. So we know how difficult to start and grow your business um, with very limited resources. That's why we would like to support the startup in the ecosystem, in the community, to help you actually grow um, without uh, worrying about much to kickstart your project on the cloud using the cloud infrastructures. And we've been supporting the modern, probably now more than 2,000 innovative businesses worldwide since we launched the program a few years ago. And last year itself, we have rebranded re the program not just to support startups, but with more perks and also expand our offers to scale up as well. So as a startup to be accepted, um, once you accepted to the program, you get up, uh, you get like $10,000 of credit voucher to be used on the cloud infrastructures. So you can use the infrastructures to enable the public cloud instances, the computer power, including machine learning model, AI training, um, managed Kubernetes services, um, and as, well, as well as the cloud storage or host of cloud, cloud that suits your need or your requirement that run uh, your solution or build your project or even do the testing on the cloud. And then um, other than the cloud infrastructure credit, you'll get access to our solution architect uh, support, um, whether from uh, discussing your design, your infrastructure design, um, how to optimize your, um, the infrastructure with OVH cloud solutions. And of course, we would like to bring the visibilities of our startup members to our network as well. That's why we help the startup to bring brand of the visibilities through our channels, whether it's social media channels, through our network, um, to our partner and so forth. So by entering the program, you're not just accepting the infrastructure credit, the support, but you're entering a network or ecosystem of OVH Cloud. So we've been partnered with um, a lot of uh, startup ecosystem, for instance, um, Startup Angels, Australians, um, to help startups in the community and also uh, it globally. So you get access to incubator, enablers, accelerator, that um, work together with us um, to support you. So you can actually make use of the platform or, or, or the networks to actually reach out to a wider audience, um, to reach out to your customers and either by the events, networking or by our community space as well. And we have uh, more than 300 of partners that we work with uh, technologically or business that will perhaps get uh, get you the access and the auto entrance to connect it um, uh, with your business. And also you get chances to access to our marketplace. Currently it's actually only in our uh, France region, but then later we'll be open up to other regions as well. And also open cluster start program. We didn't only but we have various number of program, whether uh, startup program, partner program, open trust start program that actually support the different needs of our customer and also the members. So to, how to get into the program? It's very easy. Just go to the website, put in your applications, tell us about your business, share with us um, what you're trying to solve in terms of your solutions, what the problem that you're helping the customer and uh, your team, your project, your infrastructure needs, you know, submit it online. We'll get back to you within a um, uh, few days. Then we will let you know whether you've been accepted to the program or vice versa, or you, perhaps you are more suitable with other programs that we have in the company. Then we will actually onboard you and you'll get access to the benefits of the program. And this is a 12 month program and you do not have to pay back whatever infrastructure credit that you can use uh, after the uh, program uh, period. So it is free. You have the freedom to register with us or whether you would like to actually um, 
microbiome and the needs of your your disease nature. So, for those who are new to OBH Cloud, I'm not sure anyone of you heard of OBH Cloud before or using OBH Cloud and all. Oh, nobody heard of this before. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We have, um, like I mentioned before, our technical team, uh, we have data centers in Sydney. So we have our technical team based in Sydney as well. We have a sales and marketing offices based in Melbourne, uh, in Australia. And then we have, uh, of course, in Singapore, uh, we have data center and also office there as well. Then we have in the office uh, competency center, software solution architect as well. And worldwide, we have total 32 data centers across um, four continents. And including two manufacturing um, facilities. So we design, we manufacture, and also we distribute our own servers to our own data centers. Majority of our data center is that own that we use now also. Right. That's why um, we can actually um, transparent to our customers, our users, that the cost performance ratio is much more competitive um, that we, we, we can confidence uh, Lee mentioned that um, in terms of price wise it's much more competitive because we manufacture our own servers. We have our backbone network as well that support um, the whole uh, uh, global data centers that we have for our customers, including the private network. So um, all the services that access uh, to OVH Cloud or uh, offer by OVH Cloud covered with uh, NPD loss production as well, and also highly compliance, especially for the GDPR compliance and certifications. Because we are a France-based company, uh, we've been in the market for 21 years, 22 coming. Yeah, we started the business in France um, 1999, and now it's 2021, and we expanded the business um, to the entire Europe, uh, North America, as well as um, Asia Pacific, yeah. So stay connect with us. These are our channels. Um, I will be here um, for the rest of the night. Feel free to reach out to me uh, if, if you think that you need support from a program or we can discuss with uh, for various programs that are available in OBH. <coughs> Thank you all. Oh, thanks for your time. <laughs> Yeah, Clement is our marketing and communication manager at the event. I think he's sitting at the back. You can't see him now. <laughs> yeah, and, feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Yeah. All right, so we're, we're running a bit over time. Uh, so for online attendees that are still here, thank you for bearing with us. Uh, we we'll brought up uh, shortly. I uh, obviously want to say a huge thank you to, uh, to our sponsors, helping us to, uh, you know, uh, keep on going with, uh, with the startup and adventure. Uh, so obviously, OBH Cloud, uh, Pledge 1%, as mentioned earlier, VHO, Transpire, and of course, tonight, uh, uh, Brewer. Okay, thank you so much for, for hosting us. <coughs> um, in terms of next event, our well, next event is purely online. Uh, we've got a mix of speakers from uh, Adelaide, uh, Melbourne, uh, Singapore, uh, about uh, global talent acquisition. Um, so that's mid-April, if you want to, uh, to join, same thing. Uh, for those of you who are uh, you know, signed up for the event tonight, you probably get a, at least one invitation, <laughs> and a few nudge uh, to, um, you know, to get online just after the Easter break. Uh, we we'll leave this slide on. Uh, basically, to uh, you know, give you an opportunity to give us some uh, some feedback, whether you're online or you know if about to enjoy the the feast. Now, uh, <laughs> is about to reopen the the bar. Uh, plenty of uh, plenty of food. Um, so, thank you so much for for joining us. Looking forward to continuing the the discussion of uh, a glass. And last but not least, I really wanted to uh, to thank all team. Um, for this particular, uh, Sophie uh, from uh, Guatemala now. Uh, and uh, Florencia uh, in Sydney, Trish, or my team uh, has been really instrumental in putting this event together. Um, and uh, yeah, all of you for, for joining. Very, very happy to, uh, to see you again, finally. Uh, and uh, let's hope, uh, you know, we get uh, to see each other way more on the whole. 
uh, and good, you know, well done for all of you uh, Melbournians to, uh, you know, go through this, uh, let's say, challenging 2020 and come up stronger. So thank you so much and uh, let's enjoy a few drinks now. All right, see you guys. See you soon. Uh,